Now, here I come to the Balfour Declaration. I may say I'm uh, extremely critical myself of the Balfour Declaration. I mentioned just now that I was, uh, as a young man, uh, working for the British government during the First World War on uh, the uh, Turkish Empire, which at that time, of course, included Palestine. So I had uh, certain inside knowledge of what happened at the, that time. I'm critical of the Balfour Declaration. I'm still more critical of the conduct of the British Mandate during the next 30 years, because I think we never took a line or made up our mind one way or the other, and that was, I think, extremely hard on both the Jews and the Arabs. But anyway, the Balfour Declaration is central to this uh, point of title. You know, it's a short document. Many of you probably know it by heart. I can't remember the exact words, but there are um, two sentences, really, it consists of. The first is uh, Britain undertakes to um, uh, uphold and support a Jewish national home in Palestine. The second clause is uh, provided that uh, nothing is done to harm the interests of the existing inhabitants of the country, which uh, at the time the declaration was made in 1917 were more than uh, 90% uh, uh, Arabs, of course. And uh, I blame the Balfour Declaration because the word home was uh, vague, but it was uh, made very clear, as I know directly from seeing the documents at the time, as a young temporary official in the British Foreign Office, that it was made uh, perfectly clear and was accepted by uh, Dr. Weizmann at the time that home did not mean state, uh, because if home meant state, then the uh, first clause of the uh, Balfour Declaration would have been incompatible with the second clause in it, which uh, was equally an obligation of uh, equal power and validity, equally incumbent on the British government who made the declaration that no harm should be done to the rights and interests of the existing inhabitants of the country. I do think, I suppose everybody would think, that uh, the Jews had uh, a claim to a, a national home, but um, I do think that national home uh, could not, without detriment to the, uh, the detriment we've seen, 900,000 refugees to the interests of the existing uh, inhabitants of the country, take the form of an exclusively Jewish state. It might have taken the form of a uh, Palestinian state which included uh, both uh, Jews and Arabs on a footing of equality. You might uh, say that was a theoretical possibility, and once the country had been open to uh, Jewish immigration uh, on terms cited not by the existing population themselves but by the uh, uh, British government, um, the situation was going eventually to get out of hand. It's true that all regimes and uh, peoples in Palestine uh, since AD 135 have tolerated and uh, recognized the uh, right of Jews to uh, live in Palestine. They've always at Jerusalem been uh, pious Jews studying the law in uh, this place which is the most uh, sacred place for uh, Jews in, in the world. And Turkish regime tolerated that. Uh, I don't know what the Crusaders did. If anybody didn't tolerate it, it's probably the Crusaders, but I don't know about that. Uh, but Throughout history, on the whole, that has been so. Uh, now, the national home was the enlargement of that, studying the law by about uh, 50, well, the 50,000 Jews there kind in Jerusalem at the time and about 12,000 uh, agricultural settlers, I think, in 1917. That was rather an old-fashioned uh, form of Jewish national home. And the intention of, uh, I think, uh, the Zionist movement as led by Dr. Weizmann and of the British government as represented by Mr. Balfour was to broaden the basis and to modernise the uh, Jewish national home by allowing more immigration, letting the Jews have the right, uh, as of right, within to uh, settle in Palestine. Limited numbers because of this uh, other obligation Great Britain had undertaken not to harm the interests of the existing inhabitants of the country, have a university, have all the uh, apparatus of uh, modern civilization. Now, I blame the Balfour Declaration from this sense, that uh, I think a lawyer could uh, prove that the two obligations undertaken in it were compatible, but um, perhaps it's only hindsight. Perhaps you can't blame the um, British government at the time too much for not having foreseen this at the moment, though I do blame them all the same. Both communities were going to uh, interpret this in uh, ways that were incompatible with each other. Palestine's made into a, entered the so-called A class, which were to be prepared for self-government and complete sovereign independence. The Arabs, being more than 90%, naturally thought that when Palestine became independent, it would be an Arab state with a Jewish minority. The Jews, or some of the Jews, was great controversy among different uh, branches of um, Zionists and uh, other Jews over this, interpreted the national home as merely a kind of halfway house towards the 
a Jewish state. And some, I'm afraid, said even if that's not what the British meant, we're going to use this as a lever for having a Jewish state in the end. Very human, I'm not blaming him too much for that. But uh, anyway, I myself think that the Balfour Declaration was right in uh, putting this uh, limitation. You may say it's like the pint of flesh and the drop of blood in the Merchant of Venice, that uh, if uh, there was to be no detriment to the interests of the 90% non-Jewish existing population, uh, you couldn't have much of a Jewish home. You could have a cultural one, but you certainly couldn't have a political one. Uh, I think that was the conditions that were accepted by the Zionist organization at the time and were laid down by the British, and which uh, gave the Jews something that was very near their heart's desire and uh, did... Uh, uh, on paper, safeguard the interests of the existing inhabitants of the country, which, uh, on all grounds of law and uh, morality, one uh, should do. On the statute of limitations, which has a certain legal connotation, it also has, in this context, a connotation history. I'd like to quote you, Professor. In your study, you say the Jews live on the same peculiar people long after Phoenicians and the Philistines lost yeah. their identity yeah. like all the nations. The ancient Syriac neighbors of Israel have yeah. fallen into the melting pot and yeah. have been reminted in the fullness of time with new images and superscriptions, while Israel has proved impervious to this alchemy performed by history in the crucibles yeah. of universal states yeah. and universal churches yeah. and wanderings of the nations. Extremely eloquent description, if I may say so, of Jewish survival. This statute of limitations was not recognized by history. We are the only people today in the Middle East speaking the same language, practicing the same religious faith, living in the same category of aspiration, spiritual continuity, as our forefathers thousands of years ago, as those who were exiled from there. There's nobody else from 132 of the common era in that category, in terms of continuity. Well, it was... Mr. Ambassador, recognised by history, wasn't it in this very practical sense that... Um, the Balfour Declaration. Um, no, that by 1917, um, uh, more than 90% of the population of uh, Palestine uh, were not Jews. That is the work of history de facto. Another work of history de facto is the continuing uh, memory of the Jews of Palestine and uh, their memory of Palestine and their hope for a return. But... Uh, the Balfour Declaration, he takes account of both these. Yes, points. I, I, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Um, on the question of historical association, yeah. you recognize, Professor, that there was a continuous Jewish residence in the land of Israel. Yeah. The return yeah. became the goal yeah. of the national life down the ages. It is also a fact that the Arabs never had Palestine as a separate political entity. It was controlled from remote caliphates for a number of centuries. It passed from hand to hand, 13 conquests down the ages. As the Middle East came to life in terms of the development of new nations, a process beginning after World War I, which has continued to our time and was consummated in the 40s and early 50s, the international consciousness recognized that the Arab peoples deserve nationhood and deserve independence. Deserve to achieve independence from the torpor of yeah. centuries and conquest. Yeah. <coughs> and eight Arab states came into being covering an area of close to two million square miles. They've achieved a independence, a status, without precedent, possibly even in the golden days of the Caliphate. Within that category of the Middle East, it was recognized the Jewish people, having longed and lived for its return, should establish itself once again independence and freedom in the land of Israel. <coughs> now, you have an interpretation, sir, of the Balfour Declaration based on your association work at the time, British government. But surely you will acknowledge that Lord Balfour himself, Lloyd George, Prime Minister of the government, Winston Churchill, Surely they should know what was meant by the Balfour Declaration, and they've clearly stated so down the years. And indeed, Amir Faisal, whom you met at the peace conference, he too recognized implicitly in his whole approach. Not the Jewish state. Well, well I haven't got the pact here, mm. but it's certainly implicit. But in any event, those responsible for the Balfour Declaration have clearly defined its purpose. Uh, there's talks there of religious and civil rights of other inhabitants, and on that there's never been any question. But the basic issue here is 
Well, the Arab peoples, having achieved a patrimony over eight countries and independence, millions of square miles, should not begrudge the Jewish people a state of 8,000 square miles which can work in peace and cooperation with them. Now, originally, the mandate related to both Palestine and Transjordan. In 1921, four-fifths was cut off and Jordan became independent, or development independence, the Emirate of Transjordan. So you had a further attempt to satisfy the Arab approach. And so over the years, the situation developed as it did. Now, if you look at it today, we hold neither land nor resource, water, any other resource which our Arab neighbors need for survival or advancement. Only blessing can come from cooperation, not only for us, also for them. But history has set certain principles in the approach to the whole problem of the Middle East. We have, down the ages, prayed and believed that our restoration would come, that independence would be restored, that within that context of independence, we again could make a contribution to mankind. This has taken place in our time. We believe that there are among Arab circles people who subconsciously appreciate this. But they've got to be encouraged in any attempt to raise old claims without relevance to the present situation, and we'll talk later on of the future, I think are very helpful in that regard. Uh, we can either pass now, sir, to the fossil business or... Um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, if I may take up this last point, um, the provinces of Canada stretch even further than the eight Arab countries. They stretch from uh, ocean to ocean. So surely on the Ambassador's argument, um, Canada should not uh, begrudge to the poor of Algonquin uh, such a little piece as, say, Montreal, because they've got such an awful lot left, even if uh, Montreal was given back to the Algonquins. I'm putting it in a joking form, but my serious point is that uh, the fact that those uh, eight Arab countries are happily independent um, does not affect the uh, fate of the uh, Arabs who, who lived in what is now Israel, because uh, that is not part of the uh, Arab states. And the fact that other Arabs uh, have their independence and uh, can make their own future does not make the uh, former Arab inhabitants of what is now Israel any less uh, refugees and expatriates than they are at the, uh, uh, the moment. On the Balfour Declaration, I must say explicitly that uh, I know that it was um, clearly understood at the time that uh, the national home was not intended to be a Jewish national state. And this was clearly stated to the Zionist organization by the British government at the time that the Balfour Declaration was um, issued. And uh, the declaration was accepted on those terms, and the mandate was given by the League of Nations to uh, Britain on uh, those terms. I think Britain made an awful mess of the administration's mandate. Uh, we had taken on something perhaps beyond the capacity of any country to take on, never mind. The Jews could not have made the mistake at the time of believing that uh, the Balfour Declaration promised them a Jewish state. But it is a fact, Professor. I, again, I say that I've read the interpretations given by those responsible for the Declaration. Yes. And um, the consensus of world opinion of the time and the unfolding years after that but certainly you will agree that the United Nations took a decision in November 1947 that there was to be a Jewish state in Palestine. And they took a decision later that the Arab refugees were to be repatriated that, into Israel. I, 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 they did not take such a decision, sir. Well, not take such a decision? No, no. They did not take a decision that the Arab refugees had to be repatriated to Israel. And uh, we can discuss this now, if you wish, or go on with the fossil business. I'd like to discuss that, yes. Very good. Yes. <laughs>